Hello and welcome to Trucks. On tonight's show, Brian, our resident van man, checks out the Toyota Hilux. We'll also be taking a look at what you think of the working time directive and also how it will affect your jobs. Plus, Tim checks out Iveco's cargo and daily base seven and a half tonners and gives you his verdict. Now, don't let it be said that I don't like getting my hands dirty here on trucks, and tonight is no exception. In fact, I've heard that Tim's got a little something special for me. Helen, I've heard you like them big and dirty. Ha ha, very funny. Tonight we're at Dennis Eagle's headquarters in Warwick, the largest producer of refuse vehicles in the UK. We produce roughly 600 bodies and chassis per year. We're unique in, the, in our industry, we produce a body and a chassis, so we provide a one-stop shop for our customers. Every truck is personalised to each customer's requirements, whether it's a customised Mighty Bite rear end loader or the all new Phoenix 2. It's quite a complex product, so, but also the products used to provide an essential service. Uh, if the rubbish isn't collected, you very quickly get rats and things like that in inner city areas. The thing that's puzzling us is with all these designs. Just how does the company build them all? Well, why don't you go and find out? Aye, aye, Captain. So my first port of call is to meet Roger, who's head of the Body Specialist Division within the Engineering and Design Department at this company, Danny Siegel. Hello, nice to meet you, Roger. Hello. Hi. So tell me a little bit about what you do. Well, I manage a, a team of uh, engineers that are responsible for the design and development of our body product range. From the point of the initiation of the design to fruition, how long would that take in general? Well, having had the, uh, the brief from uh, a statement of requirements, which is a requirement generated within the business and from market requirements in terms of what the product needs to do uh, and its expectations, we will then set out design um, objectives and goals. Yeah. That would drive design proposals mm. and then we would set the team off to work in various areas of that product design in order to come up with um, a proposal for, the, uh, right. for that particular product. You do customise your vehicles for your customers? Well we do in terms of building variants specific for customer needs but it's based on a modular build concept so essentially all we do is build the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle to deliver to the customer the machine variant that he requires. So what stage do you physically build the vehicle? Really we can get into prototyping within probably six to twelve months and also the cat enables you to optimize the design in terms of um, um, structural performance versus weight so we end up with a, a much nearer final uh, design iteration yeah. off the cad than was previously possible in 2D design right. process. Well it's time for Tim to enlighten us a little bit more he's over with one of the designers in the CAD department. Well hi Mark how are you? Oh, yeah, not so bad thanks. Good. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on at the moment? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a riding step system for the back of the vehicles on, in the European market, France and Germany. What is a riding step? A riding step is, is basically a platform that is bolted to the back of the vehicle that allows, allows a man to stand on it and ride on the back of the vehicle rather than getting back in the cab. Just out of interest, what size of person do you put on that then? <laughs> What's your average? Well, I always class a person as 100 kilos, even though that's heavy. Right. Um, we actually have to work to regulations for test loads on there as well, so that, that step has to support 350 kilos. That's it for the design. Join us later when we'll be seeing how they're produced. Now it's time for Brian and his Toyota Hilux. Right, when you're buying a commercial vehicle, it might not be something you've thought about before, is buying a 4x4. Now this is a Toyota Hilux 4x4, and it's a long way off the ground. Now this vehicle is very versatile, being a four-wheel drive, it'll take you anywhere, across all sorts of terrain. Let's go and give it a drive, shall we, and try it. The vehicle seems very, very light to handle. It's not heavy, like you know, like you'd expect. Four-wheel drive, everything's pulling. It's going to be hard. It's a nice drive. Now these vehicles, when they're new, do come with a three-year mechanical warranty. 
Now that is three years or 60,000 miles. Now you need to read the small print and check on things when you buy these from new because you'll probably find the vehicle one definitely will have to go back to the dealer for servicing otherwise the warranty will be null and void and also make sure of the mileage because you may clock up the 60,000 miles well before your three years are up. The thing to watch though on any four wheel drive is the turning circle. It will have a very tight turning circle. It certainly won't turn on a sixpence. You probably need a large roundabout to turn it round. And make sure if you're towing a trailer, backing up or going forward, you allow yourself plenty of room for turning. Very comfortable in cab. It's nice and spacious. Got a nice armrest, which also is a nice glove uh, compartment for putting your drinks and bits and pieces in. Seats are very comfortable. It certainly feels a very comfortable vehicle for a commercial vehicle. Now this Toyota Hilux also comes in a double cab version. And remember that these vehicles now are becoming a lot more popular. So a better fashion item and a lot more street cred. Have you got one yet? Now this Toyota four wheel drive has something very special under the bonnet. Now you've got your main battery here but you've also got an auxiliary battery. Now if you're running winches, outside lights, or any other type of power tools that are connected to this, this battery is fitted as standard, so you don't have to worry about your main battery going flat while you're actually working during the day. Very clever idea. Now, on this particular vehicle, being a 4x4 off-roader, you do get a sump guard fitted under here, but this is only a tin plate one. Now if you're serious about doing off-road work, and you're using this as a commercial vehicle across fields, maybe with a trailer on, you can get a heavy duty plate on here and also a heavy duty guard for the gearbox. Certainly worth thinking about. This particular vehicle is the Toyota 250 Hilux four wheel drive. Now they do different variants of these, but they all have the 2.5 turbo diesel intercooler engine. Now they do a 270, 280 and a 300. Now the 300 is a double cab. Right, this might just be an open back pickup. It has the ladder holders on there, so you can carry just about anything you like in the back. It's also as secure as you want to be. You can have hard tops fitted to this, lockable hard tops, with or without side windows. You can even have them colour matched to the bodywork. And on top of that, the vehicle's four wheel drive. You can take it anywhere you like. If you've ever thought about a vehicle with a lot of versatility, think about this one. Hmm, I quite fancy one of those, actually. Honestly, Helen, I could see you in one of those. Now I'm dreaming about it, but of course I'm working. What's coming up next? Well, we've seen the vehicles being designed. Now, let's go and see how they produce them. Let's get down to the production line. Tonight we're at Dennis Eagle's headquarters in Warwick, the largest producer of refuse vehicles in the UK. The process itself, um, we have a, a master schedule which is about 12 vehicles with job numbers. Um, and those are given out to uh, suppliers and they send kits into the company and they come in on, on two or three times a day and they're actually unloaded and they go out to the, the footprints or the workstations and if you're starting fabrication um, from footprint one where the floor is, they actually start the floor then put the sides on and then the roof on and it actually goes through four footprints in three and a half hours. The sheet metal that forms the dump truck body is assembled like flat pack furniture though of course they don't use glue, they weld it. While the body has been fitted together, the chassis has been prepared for the next stage. The body is rubbed down, then primed with a protective undercoating to prevent corrosion before it is sent to the paint shop for spraying. All exposed components like nuts and bolts and wiring are masked with tape to avoid damage to the parts when painted. Hydraulics and electrics are then fitted to both the chassis and the body before they are assembled. At this stage the vehicle is then sent to a specialist site in Birmingham to be painted. When it returns, the vehicle is signed written and ready for delivery. By the end of it, there's uh, 11 footprints in chassis and 11 footprints in body and hopper. And at that time, then they're actually finished. It's very much a, a, a refuse vehicle. Uh, people call them dust carts, and that tends to be the sort of vernacular, if you like. But uh, uh, we see it as a complex bit of plant on wheels. Uh, there's a lot of legislation both for uh, planting equipment and road going equipment so it's very much uh, 
Um, its proper name is Refuse Collection Vehicle. So we've seen some really cutting edge design and sophisticated production techniques. Yeah, and it's amazing the effort that goes into making a vehicle that most of us take for granted. Yeah, so John is after the break when we'll see how all this hard work makes a dirty job seem very clean. Yeah, and you're checking out Iveco's cargo and daily, the seven and a half tonners. That's it. See, see you then. then. Welcome back to Trucks. Now before the break we took a look at the design and engineering aspects of Denny Siegel's dumper trucks. You might be asking yourselves why I'm walking around this housing estate. Well the answer is I've sent Tim off to get one so we can have a drive round and see how they operate on the roads. Whilst I wait, why don't you take a look at Tim's day out that he had with Avecos, Cargo and Daily, seven and a half tonners. What was his verdict on them? Today we've got a road test with a difference for you as both vehicles are from the same manufacturer. The Aveco Cargo is the UK's best-selling 7.5 tonne truck and has been for many years. It has recently had a new lease of life with the introduction of the technically advanced Tector engine range, but the styling is still very much on the lines of a traditional truck. The 65 C15 is at the top of the Daily City truck range. It is a Aveco solution to the modern environmental issues of trucks entering city centres and local delivery routes. The whole vehicle is visually more pleasing to the eye than its 7.5 tonne cousins, probably gaining greater acceptance from the general public when delivering. Well the saying goes that small is beautiful, but as far as trucks are concerned, we're going to find out if that's true. Well, we're inside the daily and the first thing you do notice, it might sound a bit obvious, but we're definitely in a van. Compared to the cargo, which is very much a truck, this is van orientated. Driving position is first class. As I said, the comfort is wonderful. Gearbox, six-speed gearbox is standard on the, on the six and a half tonne daily, and you need it. It does really need to be pushed a little bit in terms of the torque. You need to drive it, certainly in fourth and fifth. You need to really re keep it revved up, but then, it's nice and responsive if you do that. Visibility wise, just like you expect in a van. The windows are virtually at uh, seat height, so again, you can see everything that's going on. Just what you need when doing town deliveries. The motorbike, the, the cyclist at the side of you, you need to be aware of what's going on around you. Daily is perfect for that. The 65C15 has a 2.8 litre four-cylinder, 146 brake horsepower engine with 320 newton metres of torque. It's usually coupled to a six-speed gearbox, giving it an edge over many of its competitors, and all-round disc brakes help with the car-like feel. Now, the main point of this road test is to show you the fact that you've got two different ways of actually carrying the load, whatever it is, it might be tables and chairs, it might be photocopiers, could be ice cream or whatever. Uh, the key for this is, give or take 200 kilograms, both the vehicles, the daily and the cargo, can actually carry the same amount. <music> Noise-wise in the cab, very, very good indeed. In fact, I'd say they were on a par. Surprisingly, I did expect the daily to be quieter than the cargo. But again, because of the Tector engine, I think, uh, which is very much a quiet engine, we're saying that the noise to me is no different, particularly if we're in fifth gear, sixth gear, then the noise is comparable with the daily, and therefore that's a good point for the cargo. The seven and a half ton cargo range is available with a four cylinder or a six cylinder engine. The 75E17S that we are testing is a 170 brake horsepower four cylinder Tector engine vehicle with 560 newton metres of torque. Once again, there's a choice of either a five-speed or a six-speed gearbox and has disc brakes all round. So, in our case, small is beautiful. The daily is a perfect vehicle for going round towns and urban deliveries. But if you are going that little bit further, then cargo starts to look the better option. So if Tim's to be believed, you wouldn't see the cargo driving down these streets. 
And talking of Tim, he's always keeping me waiting. Where is he? How long is he going to be? Well, let's go over to Tucker's Gripes and hear about what you say about the Working Time Directive. Traditionally, the haulage industry has seen some of the longest working hours of any occupation, sometimes in excess of 70 hours. This is now set to change, however, with the introduction of the Working Time Directive, with the maximum working hours being limited to 48. But how's that going to affect you? I hope that with the 48 hours, it'll force them into a treating drivers with a little bit more respect. Um, there aren't very many people wearing ties who have to work, work a 75, 80 hour week. Uh, we do week in, week out. Personally speaking, it's not going to really affect us, except that you're going to need more drivers, obviously for changeover and deliveries. We're short of drivers as it is, nationally, so we should be calling the shots, which would be better. On the outside, it would seem that the benefits of working less for the same money would make the job a more realistic proposition. In fact, drivers might even be able to have a proper home life. But how will the Working Time Directive affect the industry as a whole? I think it'll affect the, the haulage business as a whole. A lot of companies will go to the wall, I think. Because a lot, of, obviously, the drivers now, without the overtime, it's going to cut the hours down, obviously, when it comes in. It's going, so they won't have the overtime, most of the pay is from overtime. That's where they earn a decent wage. And a lot of firms won't be able to pay them. Listening to some of the drivers, there, there's a general feeling that uh, it will not work because if the hours of driving are reduced, then it means there's going to have to be more drivers found if the same work is to be done. And there's also, at the moment, there's a big problem finding uh, adequate drivers. And so the general feeling seems to be that the situation will only get worse. Despite worries that the legislation will force the industry deeper into trouble, the benefits should actually improve the everyday lives of drivers. Reduced hours will force the industry to get new drivers, pay will have to match current levels and perhaps, most importantly, drivers will finally be treated like human beings. I don't think we've heard the end of that issue, do you? Mm, look who I've spotted, it's Tim. Helen, get yourself in here. Where have you been? So this is the Phoenix 2? Yeah, this is it. This is Dennis Eagle's latest vehicle. Yeah. Uh, and as you can see straight away, nice vehicle. We've got uh, a three-person bench seat there. Yeah. This is a 26-tonner, 6x4. Yep. Uh, it's got the Allison automatic six-speed transmission. Right. Which is the first time I've used it, and it's very, very, very good indeed. Right, so what are all these other gadgets then? Because there's quite a lot going on here on the dash, isn't Yeah. There? Well, basically, it's made out... This is for the driver information here in yeah. front of me. Then on the centre console, we've got actually the, the rear loader. One thing yeah. you do need when you're going around towns, around cities, around estates, like we've been now at the moment, is to see what's going on, because you've got kids around there, you've got bikes, you've got old people. You've really got to have good visibility. One of the legal requirements nowadays for refuse vehicles is the fact that they've actually got to be able to monitor yeah. the, uh, the bike when they're reversing. You'll notice you get reversing bleepers when you're going back there, but also at the same time, you've got to have a visual aid that tells you that everybody's clear at the back. Yeah. As for driving, a very, very nice drive, very light steering, quite really impressive. But again, when you think about it, this thing doesn't do a lot of mileage. What it does do is a lot of turning, a lot of circles, a lot of things like that. So yeah. you've really got to have something very manoeuvrable. And yet, when you look at the size of the vehicle, it is quite big. Yeah. So you've got to have a really good turning circle. If you look here, really nice turning circle. Yeah. But at the same time, because it's a six by four, you've got some two lots of drive axles at the back. It's tending to send you in one direction. Yeah. The front wheels really have got to steer you along there. But yet, yeah, very manoeuvrable and, and very impressive. How do you operate the back bit? Right, the back bit is quite interesting. In fact, it's so interesting mm -hmm. that I'm sure that anybody can operate it. So, guess what, Helen? You're the anybody. Let's pull over then and I'll have a go. OK. Well, there's your jacket. Get on with it. Oh, OK, boss. That's it. I'm going round the back, then. Certainly are. Well, Helen's coming along here with her uh, dustbin now. 
Now, Tim thinks he's set me a bit of a task here, but between you and I, it's so simple to operate this dumpster truck, I tell you. All you literally need to do is have the engine on to start with. So, Tim, engine on. Clicking your fingers. What do you think this is? Magic? Then all you do is you take the bin up to this area here. There's a lip on the front of the bin that you just catch onto there. Now, you can have this working automatically or manually. We're going to press the blue button to start off with, lifts the bin and dumps the bin. A really wide angle, fantastic for this. You can imagine if you've, oh, we've only got Helen here, but obviously you've got three or four people all around the back of the vehicle. You can actually see all of them, no matter what they're doing. And then once that's done, we press this darker blue button, the bin comes down and is offloaded. That's how easy it is. There you go, you've seen it. Once you've done that about seven or eight times, ten times, you've got obviously all the rubbish at the back. You now need to compact it. So you've gone around the side now. Now if you want to compress the rubbish inside of here, all you literally do is go to the back, you press this top green button. This starts the compacting process. What ends it is this grey button here. Press that, that finishes the process off, puts all the rubbish into that part of the truck, which leaves this front bit of the truck ready for more garbage. It's as easy as that. We get a signal then in the, uh, in the cab here telling us that the compact is full and then we go off to the waste tip and empty off and it all starts all over again. OK, Helen, you've got the job. Well, that's it for this week. But join us next week when Brian will be testing out the Volkswagen LT. I'll be doing an 18 ton road test. We'll be listening to your truckers' gripes. And Helen and I will be having fun with Fortless. So, see you then. <laughs>